All right, so we're going to talk about CBT and REBT. Um, I didn't get a chance to look. Did somebody do uh, a student uh, role play? You did? Okay, good. So I'm going to post them on D2L so everybody can watch them, and I'll watch them tonight when I get home. Um, but, uh, but so this is kind of a shorter class just because these theories are shorter, but they're theories that are used in so much research out there. And, uh, so everybody talks about CBT and, um, so much research has been done on CBT. I can tell you why. Um, CBT and REBT are both seen as short-term therapies. That's attractive to researchers because they want results so that they can write up that article and get published. Um, the other thing is it is a measurable result. So somebody can come in, they say, I have this phobia, let's use CBT. They address the irrational thought, it goes away, you measure it with a survey. There are some serious problems with the research done on CBT. Uh, first of all, there are limitations to the research. First limitation is that um, it's mostly self-reported answers. And people want to please their therapists, uh, believe it or not. Um, so they want to have success with the therapy. Um, it's fairly easy for an individual to understand an irrational thought to substitute some positive self-talk and to feel better. But it's usually addressing a symptom of a deeper issue. And CBT usually doesn't go deeper. They address symptomology. Um, so what happens is they deal with the irrational thought, the surface symptomology disappears and they leave therapy, success, bam, most successful therapy ever. And yet a few months later, a different symptom comes back or the same symptom. So it's not truly extinguished or the underlying issue gets stronger and more powerful and impacts the individual's ability to function in their daily lives to a greater degree. So I don't think there's anything wrong with any type of cognitive therapy. I prefer REBT because the process is easier to explain to a client However, I usually use it in connection with a theory that can deal with deeper issues. And I use CBT and REBT all the time. The, the reason I use them is that almost every human being carries with them some irrational thought. I have irrational thoughts all the time. Um, so, you know, I think that, uh, it's a normal part of being a human being. Some irrational thoughts are more detrimental to us than other irrational thoughts. So, uh, there is a matter of severity, uh, and impact on our lives. So, Let's look at the theories, talk about how we might incorporate them, what they're really good for, 
And uh, so they are good for certain things. Uh, they're good for phobias. Um, they're good for panic attacks. Uh, sometimes they're good for anxiety. Uh, so they're all kind of related in that realm of phobias, anxieties, panic attacks, things like that. They're good when we deal with re personal regrets. I incorporate them into um, my own regret theory and regret therapy. Um, but it's a part of a larger process. Um, so, so let's look at the theories. Um, so Albert Ellis uh, is, uh, I posted, he's the third therapist with Gloria. And you, these three therapists with Gloria are each so different. I mean, you've got Rogers, who's like Fred Rogers. You've got Pearls, who's all sarcastic and confrontational. And then you've got Ellis, who kind of sits back and likes to hear himself talk and talks most of the time. Uh, so his his main deal with Gloria is teaching her, uh, you know, R-E-B-T. Cognitive therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy, it started out as cognitive therapy and R-E-B-T, rational emotive behavior therapy. People often interchange them and uh, one is by Aaron Beck, CBT or CT. One is by Albert Ellis, REBT. And I tried to figure out not only which one came first, REBT came first, but only by a small amount of time. And uh, both individuals used their ideas and therapies. Most of the ideas are interchangeable between the two theories. Um, but I, I, I never found an article where either Beck or Ellis said, hey, you know, that guy stole my theory, but they're so identical. So I will give five points to anybody five bonus points to anybody who can find some documentation where either Ellis or Beck throws their buddy under the train and says, that guy stole my theory. Because one of them did. Maybe they were just being respectful or professional, but, you know, there's got to be something out there. All right. So five bonus points. You can miss a discussion board for that. Uh, all right, so let's talk about the two different theories. First one is Albert Ellis. Their personalities are very different because Albert Ellis, I mean, they were both teachers, both professors, but Albert Ellis, was really big into writing self-help books. And Beck was really into writing um, assessments and academic articles. So Beck is often talked about more in academic settings, simply because he wrote in journals and he came up with the two most famous uh, mental health inventories. Uh, the Beck's uh, depression inventory and the Beck's anxiety inventory. And uh, the second version of each one is fairly accurate. There's a couple versions of them. Um, and they're still used today. So the BDI is probably the most famous. Uh, 
most of the individuals who use some type of cognitive theory for uh, for studies uses Beck's cognitive therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy. And then he got his daughter involved in it as well. She kind of carried on the theory. And I think that's just because he was more academic than he was self-help. I personally think that Ellis had a more comprehensive theory and applied it to more areas of mental health and life. But you'll see when you watch that Gloria tape, she's like, oh, Dr. Ellis, I read all of your books. You had a famous book on how to catch a man. You know, well, that was, you know, a popular self-help book. Uh, so he wanted to reach the masses, not just academia. But at the same time, I think Ellis applied his concepts to more common areas of life. And so it became a little more comprehensive than Aaron Beck's theory. So, you know, they each had their own thing. Uh, so let's look at Albert Ellis first. He uh, born in 1913, died in 2007. I think it said he died in a, a hospital surrounded by family and students and taught until his last breath. Well, once you watch the video with Gloria, you'll understand a little more about that comment. So he was born in Pittsburgh, but he moved to New York City at the age of four. Anybody else know who was born in Pittsburgh and moved to New York City at the age of four? Pretty famous. Andy Warhol. So his health was never good. He was hospitalized nine times as a child for kidney disease and then uh, renal problems and at 19 and then he had diabetes at 40. So here we have yet another individual who suffered with health issues and then became a little introspective and ended up in psychology. Um, at age 19, he was shy and he forced himself to talk with 100 women at the Bronx Botanical Gardens over one month. I find this ironic. He never got a date, but he no longer feared rejection. I would think he might get a date talking to a hundred people, but no. Um, I guess no longer fearing rejection's a, a bonus point. I don't know. Uh, so he studied psychoanalysis, moved away from that very quickly to create REBT, Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy. So he says it combines humanistic, phenomenological, and behavioral therapy. I'm not so sure about that, but, you know, he likes to say that. Uh, it includes cognitions, emotions, behaviors. Um, they all interact just like they do in multimodal therapy. I think that the thing that both CBT and REBT relate to the most is Adler's techniques that you read when we were studying Adler. And Adler just calls all of CBT basically one of his many techniques, but he gives him no credit. So I think this was all done before by Adler. Um, so he believes that people contribute to their own psychological symptoms 
by the way they interpret events. Self-statements promote behavior. The Greek philosopher Epictetus said, people are disturbed not by things, but by the view which they take of them. Yeah, so I would say that's true. So here we have two individuals, they get into a cab, they're both sitting in the back seat, and a truck comes and hits them head on. The car, the cab is demolished, and they, they survive, they're not injured, and they're sitting on the curb, and one of them says, what a miracle. This is a fantastic day. We were hit by a truck. We survived without any scratches. Fantastic. The one who was sitting right beside them says, oh my gosh, what a horrible day. I can't believe we were hit by a truck. Uh, this just ruined everything. Exact same thing happened to both of them. It's a little more than the glass is half full, the glass is half empty. It's their interpretation of a life event. It's the way they interpret what happened to them. And then consciously, it's what they say to themselves as a result of that event. So one person was happy and excited. The other was sad and it ruined their day. So, so much of how we feel is a result of how we interpret external events in our lives. So, his clients are usually educated to some degree. They practice skills to dispute their irrational beliefs. So what I really like about his theory is that REBT is really easy to use with clients. And that's because he uses the ABCDEF techniques. He would call it a method. And when you use REBT for your next exam, your techniques are going to be A, B, C, D, E, F. That's the answer to your techniques. So you're going to apply A, B, C, D, E, F to Sam's irrational thoughts. So the first three letters, when you apply them to an individual client, they help the client to understand the irrational thought that they carry with them. That irrational thought leads to their own interpretation or misinterpretation of an event in their lives. So ABC finds the problem. DEF is the resolution it corrects the irrational thought and substitutes a positive thought. So here's the thing with Sam and the exam. You're going to use ABC twice. You're going to use it in the past so it's really easy to apply to the dad and the mom and the crummy childhood he had. That's easy. But the second time you use it is as a technique in the session, in the present, where dad and mom aren't there anymore. And now we're going to apply it to Sam himself. What negative talk or irrational thoughts does he apply to himself when dad and mom are no longer in the picture. So rather than him thinking, dad won't like this, he's being self-critical. He's incorporated 
those irrational beliefs when he examines himself and his own actions. So an example might be, uh, you know, um, Sam might uh, go to one of his co-workers' parties and uh, he might start talking with somebody he likes and that other person might excuse themselves and say, excuse me, I have to go to the restroom. And Sam might say, oh, why did I even bother talking to this person? They can't stand me. They don't even want to talk to me. And the consequence of that is, you know, being sad or feeling unwanted or undeserving or unworthy of a relationship. So A, the activating event. He went to talk to somebody at a company party. B, the belief. Well, that person said they had to excuse themselves and go to the restroom. And his belief about that event would be, oh, they hate me. They can't stand me. They don't even want to be around me. The consequence is some negative emotions about his own self-worth. So see, his dad's not even in the picture anymore. He's incorporated these irrational beliefs into his own being. So that's ABC, takes us to a negative interpretation of an event using an irrational thought process. DEF, how are we going to fix this? Well, you know, his friend might come up, maybe his friend is Alice. And He's like, I can't believe I even talked to this person. Everybody hates me. I'm a no good Nick. And, uh, you know, so he doesn't want to even talk to anybody anymore. He doesn't even want to take a chance on a relationship. And so his friend Albert starts saying, well, does everybody really hate you? Do I hate you? We get along pretty well. And she said she had to go to the restroom. Maybe she did. So he begins to dispute the irrational thought process that misinterpreted, or what he would say, catastrophized a simple event, which really had no meaning at all. And so... That's D. We're going to dispute the irrational thought using reason and positivity. The effect is, oh, well, maybe, maybe that's true. Maybe they don't hate me. Maybe everybody doesn't hate me. Maybe I am worthy of a relationship. Maybe somebody would like me. Maybe they did just have to go to the restroom. So the effect is a more rational thought process. Now, I usually add another component to this. I usually add some positive self-talk. So they've gotten to a more rational belief about an event well, now that you have overcome that negative thought, what would a positive thought be next time you're thinking this irrational thought? And they have to say it themselves in order for them to own it. So I make them come up with one simple sentence. Well, next time I'm feeling rejected, I might think, oh, well, it's not about me. Something's going on with them. I'm worthy of talking with and I'm worthy of a relationship. I can be a good friend, something like that. If you 
watch any older Saturday Night Live programs. They used to have a guy named Stuart Smalley, and he'd look into a mirror and he'd say, uh, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. Positive self-talk. And my favorite one was when he was with like Magic Johnson. Um, so the final thing, F, what's the result? A different feeling, a more positive feeling about self, which will result in new actions to be taken, new behaviors. Maybe he won't feel so insecure the next time he sees somebody he wants to talk to because he doesn't have such a negative feeling about this irrational time that it happened. All right, so you run through A, B, C, D, E, F. And that is the technique for REBT. Try to include one sentence of positive self-talk that they can repeat to themselves next time they have that negative thought or that irrational thought. Um, let's see, Aaron Beck, um, I think he's still alive. Uh, instead of calling them irrational thoughts, he calls these things cognitive distortions, but it's the same thing. A rational, irrational thought is a cognitive distortion. He has some vocabulary in the notes, arbitrary inferences, making conclusions without evidence. He also calls this catastrophizing. Selective abstraction, making conclusions based on only one isolated detail of an event. Well, she had to go to the restroom. Therefore, I'm a horrible, unwanted, unlikable person. Overgeneralization, extreme beliefs based on a single incident applied inappropriately to a dissimilar event or situation. So, you know, uh, there's lots of people that, you know, I don't know if I'd want to hang out with. I don't know if they'd want to hang out with me, but I'm not going to believe the same thing about every person I meet. I'm going to give other people the benefit of the doubt. Magnification and minimization. Perceiving a situation in greater or lesser light than it deserves. I failed this quiz. I'll never be a doctor. Personalization relating external events to oneself without basis. Oh, somebody couldn't come to a party. They must hate me. They don't want to be around me. Labeling and mislabeling portraying one's identity on imperfections or mistakes rather than on the whole person. I can't believe I did that. Now nobody will like me. Polarized thinking, thinking in all or nothing terms. Now, sometimes it's like extremes. Sometimes Ellis uses the same word for the same definition. Sometimes Ellis uses different phrases for the same concept, but really they carry around the same bag of concepts or vocabulary. Some differences, so REBT can be very directive. CBT or CT, well, Beck thinks he wants to have a Socratic dialogue with open-ended questions. Uh, 
REBT uses the term irrational beliefs. CT uses the word cognitive distortions. CT is used for depression and with the example of the BDI, the Beck's Depression Inventory. So those are pretty short theories. That's, that's the basics of them. Um, we're going to uh, watch uh, Gloria together, but let's take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back at quarter after five. We'll watch Gloria. It's only about half an hour, but then I want to have a, a little brief discussion on it. Any questions about REBT, ABC, DEF? All right, we'll see you in 10 minutes. I was just in class. I took a break. What are you doing? Oh, so I wanted to tell you. So, you know, I said I would edit the case that box. So I, so I pull up a page that um, Susan Dan Real has worked.
Gracias. Mm -hmm.